Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Michael Jakon tōku ingoa. I would like to acknowledge uh, Ngāti Fatua Oreki in this. Kia ora. Um, today we are here to honour Chris Tees. Okay. Tees. He is our honoured writer today. I'm just stressing the hour, hour on a writer on this thing here, but I know that you are, you know, the, ca the nations are on a writer as well and beyond, but I just thought I'd stress that just to begin, Chris. Okay. Um, I thought I would begin um, by way of welcome uh, with um, the introduction uh, and introduction with the um, the a kongyo a koinyo Anna, I wish bio-like paragraph from Angela Barnett in the recent Sunday, ta Sunday Star Times magazine. I'm a bit of a reader of them, I must, I must, I must uh, admit, and particularly the quick shots where, um, you know, things tell us, for example, about you, Chris, you know, cooking or gardening? Cooking. Okay. Um, new outfit or old favourite? New outfit. Okay. <laughs> I think we are in sync. Okay. <laughs> But of course, I've got hundreds of old outfits, which I just keep in the back, back of the closet. Okay. Um, so, I th yeah, I just thought I'd, I'd read that, okay, and um, maybe, maybe stop, and s stop in various places and read it out, okay, as a way of introduction. Okay. So here it is. Uh, I wish. Okay. So, <coughs> our 13th Poet Laureate. is a prophet hiding in a 40-year-old body. <laughs> I must say, I, just, I must say, I found, that, I found that opening quite shocking. Did you think I was 50? <laughs> it's the Asian genes. <laughs> no, actually, Chris, it was the use of the word hiding. I just don't think of you as hiding, okay? I, I am very shy, and uh, even something like this is, is kind of um, a, bit, a bit weird to, to have like um, the honored uh, writer title attached to it. Um, and you know, I, I still haven't quite gotten to the point where I introduce myself as the Poet Laureate. Uh, it just feels surreal, yeah, so. I do, I do feel like I hide a lot of stuff, even though my writing probably doesn't suggest that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, you know, I I if I go too far, you know, it's just kind of nod or something, and I'll kind of, you know. Um, and by the way, just in terms of the um, that that number that was mentioned there, I've worked out that between us on stage here, we have in fact uh, 109 chronological years. So I just thought I'd mention that to get as a kind of a, you know. Um, in case something was going on there. Um, it goes on. Chris Tees lures you in, lures you in with a book collection, with book collection titles such as How to Be Dead in a Year of Snakes, then expands your thinking in as few syllables as possible, cracking open themes about racism, queer sexuality, homophobia, Chinese heritage and pop culture. He started writing poetry as a teen in Lower Hutt, rebelling as he jokes, and this is in speech marks, so I'm assuming it's a, a quote, rebelling, <laughs> I hope it is, <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> deny it. Well, we know where Angela is, so you know, we're okay. Um, rebelling as he jokes against his parents' desire for him to do something sensible like, calcula like calculus or accounting, unquote. With poems such as gentleman poet in the streets, raging homosexual in the sheets. He is changing what poetry is and can be in Aotearoa. His regular Friday poems are like a caffeine fix in the morning to readers, a rush to, the ca a rush to calm in, in a, a rush to calm a crowded mind. T says poetry is often a happy accident, quote, throwing a couple of unusual words together heading into unknown territory. 
he doesn't ever sit down to write about X. I'd just like to pick out a few, unless you want to have a general comment on that just to begin with. Um, I, I haven't actually read the article. <laughs> And I had, um, and I had actually forgotten what I had um, answered for those different prompts. I had someone come up to me at the staff lunchroom the other day and said, "Oh, Chris, I read your article in the Sunday Star Times." Like, oh, okay. Really glad to hear that you're an Optimus Prime fan. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. I said that. <laughs> but I stand, I'm sure I stand behind all of it. <laughs> I think you have to at the moment, Chris. Um, so. Uh, so, so, so some of the statements I'd like to think about, especially the, w the those ones about how you came to poetry, and and then here you're talking about um, uh, some maybe some form of rebellion or reaction against parental concerns, okay, and el elsewhere, um, such as in uh, the there's a Guardian interview with um, Charlotte Graham May, uh, you talk about where you fell in love with poetry um, after your high school friends started bringing terrible angsty. Uh, poems about their crushes to read uh, to each other at lunchtime. Um, I, the thought just crossed my mind when I first read that. Uh, was it a co-ed school? Yes, it was. It was a co-ed um, school. Hutt okay. High in Lower Hutt. Okay. What was it? Hutt Valley High. Hutt Valley High. And I was wondering, d did you share any poems? I did. So my friends were starting to write poems and sharing them at lunchtime. And I kind of felt like, well, I, I don't want to miss out hanging out with my friends, so I would start writing poems and bringing them to school and share them at lunchtime as well. And this, this just became a thing that we did. Um, and in, in some ways, looking back on it, it was kind of like our first, well, my first writing workshop. Um, and I, I think, you know, I kind of took it to the next level because what I would do is I would print out all of these poems and arrange them into little sets with, like, overarching titles and then keep them in clear file folders. Um, and I still have like four of these clear file folders and I actually um, unearthed them to write an article for the spin-off about teenage poetry. Um, and they are terrible. But looking back on them, I can kind of see, ah, oh, I was clearly writing about being gay in this poem, but I was just too scared to actually put that into words. And I was sort of using it as an outlet to figure out, all right, w what is this and, and why? Am I constantly thinking about this particular thing? Um, and then it wasn't until I got to university and realized that you can actually take papers where you, all you do is write poetry. And I thought, okay, well, I've been doing that at high school. Why don't I just sort of try and see uh, whether I can get into those papers? Because for me, writing had always been there as sort of one of those creative outlets as a teenager. I used to write song lyrics and I would write plays and things like that for my friends and even my siblings and, and bro uh, cousins to, to perform. So, so story writing and, and words, always a big thing in my life. Um, and then, yeah, knowing that you could do that at university was quite a revelation. Much to my parents' uh, annoyance, I think. <laughs> they um, definitely wanted me to go off and do a commerce degree, uh, which I completely avoided. Should I move back? Nope. Should I move back? Uh, okay. <laughs> Seems to be okay. I think Liam will, will sort, out, sort us out. Uh, you did a double degree, did you? No. So I ended up just doing um, a BA in English Literature and okay. Film and then went on to do the Masters in Creative Writing. Just with those, um, those earlier poems, just a thought. So with that kind of juvenilia, you said you've still got them and you've actually retrieved them for that article. Is there, have you ever, th have you had any, ever had any other thought of maybe um, revisiting them in, an, in another way, maybe in a reflective way? Uh, it's just that I'm actually doing something like that at the moment um, with them, uh, with my ju what I would call my juvenilia, in part prompted by um, He's So Mask, but I'll talk to you about that later. Yeah, I just wondered, had you, s you seen them in any other light? I think I'm just going to let them <laughs> collect dust for a while. Um, okay. What, I mean, one of the interesting things is, like, uh, being named Laureate, um, one of the things that is attached to it is that, that you know, you, I work quite closely with the National Library now, and one of the, not clauses, but one of the things that um, they say that they'll do is they will work with me to um, archive anything that I write during my tenure. 
Um, but because I, uh, you know, these days I just write on a laptop or on a phone, like I don't actually really keep like, you know, drafts and all that sort of stuff. I'm trying to make it a habit, so I sort of save new versions so that I can kind of trace all that sort of stuff. But just, you know, thinking about that made me also think about all of that really old stuff that is still floating around in, in paper form and thinking, okay, maybe one day this will be in the National Library. Um, hopefully I'll be long gone by then and I don't <laughs> I won't have to see people's reaction to it. Well, you know, we have people with us who are in the National <laughs> Library, so they could, they could mostly vouch the deepness of the, the depth of the vault, you know, so we can take it from there. Um, uh, uh, also in here in I Wish, um, there is uh, references to your creative processes. Um, and similar to a number of comments I've, I've read elsewhere, so we, we're talking about um, uh, um, you, uh, the, the idea that um, uh, poetry being a happy accident, uh, throwing a couple of unusual words together leading to unknown territory and that you don't uh, ever, 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 ever sit down, that was my evers, ever sit down to write about X. Um, I was just thinking about this and um, uh, wondering, oh my God, I must try that, but it suddenly occurred to me, I was wondering whether this um, happy accident and fusion of unusual words, unknown territory, I wonder is it some kind of, some kind of zone do you think it's some kind of a zone? I think I, I go into, uh, so I, what I do is I tend to just write lots of scraps down um, in my phone uh, or just on a Word document on my laptop. Uh, and then the next part of that is figuring out, all right, uh, what, are, what goes together? Um, I know that this is probably gonna be a poem about this. So how do I sort of like then start to fill the gaps? Um, I've, I have found it really hard in the past and actually with prose. Um, I can't write from A to Z like that. Like my thinking just is all over the place and then I sort of piece it together um, through the editing and the rewriting process. Um, but one of the interesting things is I have started to write um, acrostics and that's actually a form that is actually forcing me to write in a very linear form because um, I'm trying to just use that you know, next letter or that, or that next line mm. to to guide where that poem is going. Um, so that's sort of me, I guess, in a way, trying to retrain my brain in, in terms of how I write. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that sort of comment about, like, I don't... Talk louder. Talk louder. Okay. Is that better? Okay, sorry. <laughs> no one's ever asked me to do that. Um, I... What was I going to say? Um, Acrostics. So, yeah, retraining my brain to write um, in, in that sort of linear fashion. Um, mostly because at the moment, yeah, oh, that's right. Um, the not sitting down to write, a, write about X, um, that's actually changed quite a bit since becoming laureate because I am now being asked to write poems for events or um, certain things. So I kind of now have to sit down and think, all right, well, I, I have to write a poem about this particular topic. How am I going to... Um, figure that out, but then again, you know, I will just throw a whole bunch of words, images, things down, and then figure out how to piece it all together, yeah. Um, could you just, um, I'll mostly come back to the Poet Laureate and the writing about X, the, the, the Poet Laureate and the writing about X later. Um, could you um, just, maybe just just quick, uh, a quick uh, definition of uh, acrostics? Uh, so that's when, um, when you look at the first letter of um, each line of a poem, it actually spells out um, something. So the reason why I've, I've um, started writing acrostics is because when the Queen passed away, everyone was asking me, where is your poem about the Queen? And I had to very diplomatically and gently say, there's no way I'm going to write a poem about slash for the Queen. Um, not my thing. Uh, interestingly, uh, Simon Armitage, who is the UK Poet Laureate, um, he's kind of expected to have to write poems for the Queen and royal family members. And he ended up writing a double acrostic. So if you look at the um, lines of his poem, it spells out Elizabeth, Elizabeth. And everyone said, oh, well, my friend said, oh, maybe you should write an acrostic. Um, I dare you to write an acrostic that says Shakira, Shakira. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did. 
Um, and then now that sort of got me onto the path of writing acrostics, which I think are, um, I'm, as poet laureate, I'm gonna make them a thing again. I'm bringing them back. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, I was just, uh, <laughs> I was just, just uh, the thought just came to me when you were talking about writing, you know, being asked to write a poem about the Queen. Now, I guess you could have written a poem about a Queen and, um, you know, put it out there. I wrote a poem about Queen Shakira. There you go, <laughs> there you go, okay. Um, the, just staying with this idea, interesting what you've said that you, um, uh, I know, you, you know, you're now having to write about X uh, in a way. Um, the, the this inter, you know the, this thing this um, kind of bio thing and other and, and in other places that I've read does point out to um, d does talk about you cracking open themes such as racism, queer sexuality, pop culture, and so on, and um, not writing anything about X made me wonder uh, not tending to maybe wonder that uh, are these things therefore intrinsic to your being, to your character, to your experience, so, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, so for the longest time, I didn't want to write about being Chinese, um, especially when I started writing it, because I felt that that was too obvious. Um, I also felt that because there was, a, was, there was an absence of it, um, that no one was interested. So I kind of left that alone and um, just wanted to write about going out and getting drunk, um, which is totally legit, but you know. <laughs> when, when I started the master's program, I found that the poems that I was writing that actually kind of got um, more of a response were the poems where I wrote about um, my family, especially my great-grandfather who came to New Zealand um, in 1919. And then, um, that year, 2005, was the 100-year centenary of the murder of um, Jo Kim Yong, uh, which is uh, what prompted me to then start writing about his murder and the circumstances around that. And I think that was when I sort of realized, I think this is the sort of stuff I need to be writing, if not for myself, then for other people um, to put that out into the world to, to, to create visibility around some of this stuff. Um, and then as I sort of started to become more comfortable with who I am and started coming out to people about being gay, that's when I started to be a bit more bold and actually write about it quite explicitly um, and, you know, put it into the poetry and put it out into the world, which was really terrifying at first. but for me was really important. And now, you know, a lot of what I write is that intersection between those two different parts of me. And I think I am still using poetry as a way to figure all of that out for myself. Um, I talk to other writers who sort of feel like they're, they're often writing the same poem or writing the same book. But for me, I guess that's just a process of, you know, mining that topic or that issue to get understanding to to figure out you know w actually where do I sit with this topic this issue what does this say about me what does this say about who I am as a person and how I interact with the world so yeah those things have I guess become my fixations my obsessions uh, but I try to sort of like mix it up a bit and and I think you know putting that sort of pop culture element into it is my way of um, resh reshaping or, or shifting the, the perspective of it for myself and to have a bit of fun with it as well. Thank you, Chris. I think that was just amazing to hear that. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's, uh, it's most probably finished our interview, but, um, but no, but thank you. That is a tremendous way to uh, talk about things. I mean, uh, it's making me think about, you know, my own writing. Thank you so much. Let's therefore go into the books a little bit, if we, if we may. Um, uh, and all of these books, you know where they are as we as we sit here. Okay, um, I'm thinking about these. Oops, these three um, books to begin with. One moment, please. Uh, how to be and it, when the, it, in terms of being able to hear if if 
if, if I kind of look out into the audience and, um, you know, if you kind of nod or something or, you know, let me know that you, that you want us to speak louder, J just do that. That'll be great, okay? We'll, we'll try. I'm very loud. <laughs> Do you want to comment about anyone else on the stage, Liam? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, now the first book. <laughs> I didn't know being honoured was going to be like. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, it's all good. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> so, How to Be Dead um, in a Year of Snakes, uh, 2016 Ockham NZ Book Awards finalist, and subsequently Jesse McKay Award for best first book of poetry. He's so mask. Oh, he's so mask. <laughs> I, I was just wondering whether, you, I mean, I'm, I'm wanting to say he's so mask, you know. Well, uh, Greg, my designer, did add the italics um, onto the title, which I, which I loved the first time I saw that. I thought, ah, oh, yep, he's, he's cracked it, yeah. Okay. Um, named one of New Zealand's best books, uh, the one New Zealand Herald's best books, 2018, and the spin-off's um, 20 uh, best poetry books of 2018. And um, Super Model Minority, uh, currently on the Ockham Long List. Tremendous, okay. Which I think is, the short list is announced in March. Uh, just a quick, a uh, quick thought. Is that what's it like having? Um, I most probably want to know for personal reasons. <laughs> what's it like having this kind of acknowledgement? Uh, you know, get, getting lists, getting on lists, winning prizes, winning huge prizes, etc. Uh, to, to you personally, is it what? Is it a form of um, of recognition or? You know, yeah, um, I actually wrote about winning the Best First Book Award uh, for the um, Academy of New Zealand Literature website um, last week. And f for me, that was a really big boost in confidence, um, validation for a lot of work. Um, you know, I started writing those poems in 2005, and then the book came out in 2014, and then the awards weren't until 2016. So, yeah, it kind of felt like a really um, lovely way to cap off, you know, quite a big journey for that particular book. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just stoked that Supermodel Minority is on the long list um, for, for this year's awards because last year was um, such a great year for poetry in Aotearoa. Uh, so many great books and, you know, so many amazing books that didn't make it onto the long list. And you can, th this, is the, this is the thing about these awards is that sometimes you don't want to invest mm. emotionally into them and you kind of try to just, you know, keep it at the back of your mind and, you know, if you get in, that's nice. If you don't, then you just get on with it if you can. Um, because um, He's a Mask um, didn't make it onto the long list. And um, I, the, the, the initial reaction was I was really upset, <laughs> which is, and I look back on it now and think, oh, God, it's just an award. But, you know, awards, as they say, only mean something to the people that win them and are up for them. Um, and the, the recognition is really nice, but, you know, books don't live or die depending on the, the sticker that's on it. Like, Hiso Mask has gone on to have such a wonderful life. Um, and I've you know, met so many amazing people and had amazing conversations about it. And it, it um, just reminds me that, yeah, books will find their readers. The, thank you. The, 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 um, the books have been described by a, 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 as a loose trilogy. I don't know whether you actually have ever used that term. Um, and... Um, I was wondering what you thought of this idea of them being a loose trilogy. Also, it also contains a, the seed of the idea of something of completion, doesn't it? Mm. But um, what are your thoughts on this notion in regard to the books? Yep, so when we were putting the um, marketing together, that, that's kind of what I said. I think this is, this is a loose trilogy. Um, so I obviously didn't set out to write a trilogy of books. But then when I was writing Supermodel Minority, I kind of realized that, ah, what I've done is I've written a book about the past, I've written a book about the present, um, which is very much like my own personal experience and, and um, life journey. And now Supermodel Minority is a book that looks out to the future and tries to imagine a world without 
racism and homophobia and the rather bleak nihilistic conclusion I come to as well the only way that's going to come about is th is if the world ends um, I know very pessimistic <laughs> um, but you know it's it for me it was interesting to kind of see that as I was writing the, the most recent book and in some way that was the key I needed to unlock where supermodel minority was going to go I didn't really have an idea about it when I started writing the poems they were sort of just falling into place but once I sort of figured that out it made it really easy to finish the book it also meant that I could then go back to the first two books and in fact even further back to um, AUP New Poets 4 and do a bit of like self-referencing and sort of build in those little nods and winks to the previous books and the previous poems to draw it all together um, so there are yeah, little references in Supermodern Minority that are either um, riffs on previous poems um, or sort of borrow those images again and sort of like finds new ways to, to make them feel new again. There are threads and connections through the through the three books, and also I, I feel I feel an aspect of this uh, of this uh, trilogy concept is the way your poetic forms and craft have have uh, changed and expanded um, to suit your subject matters mm. and your poetic voice. Uh, and it's just, I find it just absolutely stunning. You know. I, in the session before, you know, there was talk about how um, writing gets harder, but you get better at it. And I really felt like with Supermodern Minority, for the first time in my um, career, that I kind of know how to write a poem. Um, I kind of felt like, ah, oh, okay, I'm okay at this, I can do this, and um, finishing that book felt like um, the biggest victory lap in a, in a weird sort of way, um, because, you know, the, the, the time it took for How to Be Dead in Your Snakes just felt like it was such a prolonged process, and that um, every setback just felt mo too momentous, and, um, and I couldn't, like, continue with it, but, you know, I persevered. And he's a mess because it is such a personal collection. Every time I finished a poem, I would be riddled with like worry that this was way too personal and putting out way too much into the world. Whereas I feel like I now have settled into my skin a bit better as a person and as a poet, so that writing um, Supermodern Māori felt natural in a way, mm. and I could actually feel confident about some of the things that I put into those poems and, you know, stand behind them. Like, I stand behind all of the poems, but th this book in particular, I feel like this is who I am now, and this is, this feels like, um, this, this, is, this feels like my statement, mm. in a way, yeah. Are you happy to go back a, a little bit about some of the books? Mm. Um, uh, and, that, and that line you just said, um, uh, writing gets harder but you get better. Is that what you said? It's, yeah. Something I think I was like paraphrasing someone on the previous session. Yeah, uh, which is a wonderful statement to put down, for, you know, to for us, to, us as writers or would-be writers to to think about. Okay. I've got to say, after reading, rereading, and reading your books, I honestly thought I was so overwhelmed by them that I kind of thought that um, I don't know if I'm ever going to write another poem. <laughs> but then, but the reverse of that is is that I've also been incredibly inspired by them. I'm not just up here in the spotlight saying this to you. This was, a, this was, this was the wonderful feeling I had. With How to Be uh, Dead in a Year of Snakes, I have to say I found them the, I found it this, this kind of sequence giving voice to, um, you know, the, 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 murdered per the, the murdered man and to a certain extent the murderer, I found it the most moving and affecting and beautiful piece of writing. It will be up there with, uh, you know, I could quote other books, but it will be up there. It is astounding um, piece of writing. Um, and Sh Siobhan Hardy said a little bit, s s said in the um, Beatty's book blog about the language that it was the actual language and the marrying of the content. It's in the best traditions of poetry. What it imbues its subjects matter with which prose could never do, 
is music, language play, heightened rather than understated emotion, theater and meditation. And I, I see that you have acknowledged Siobhan in the, um, in a bit later in uh, He's So Mask, and I just think that she is a, she's a, this is by, I think she's a, a miracle and a treasure and on every single level. So Siobhan was um, my mentor and she helped me to finish um, How to Be Dead in the Year of Snakes. Um, I had reached the point where I knew that this was going to be my first book, or I wanted it to be my first book. And because, you know, the, the poems had sort of started off as like a group of like five poems, and it kind of grew to 12, and then I thought, oh, maybe it just needs to be one really long poem. And then I uh, thought, no, this is, this is a story that kind of needs, um, yeah, like a, a book length sequence to, to tell it so that I could also paint the picture and, and provide the context of why this murder was so significant in our history and also to bring a little bit of my own personal experience into it so my grandmother had passed away while I was writing the last bits of it and so the whole ritual of um, seeing her off and mourning her death um, fed a lot into those poems and I'm really glad that the book took as long as it did um, because I don't think I, as a 22-year-old doing my master's, would have written that, s that same book. I, I needed that experience mm -hmm. in, in life and in losing someone close to me to understand, ah, this is, this is what grief is mm -hmm. and this is how, you know, not only we as Chinese people articulate it and, um, and mark it, but, um, you know, understanding what it would mean in, in, a, in a bigger sense in terms of um, Aotearoa's history and race relations and the way Chinese people were treated um, back in that time period. Mm. Well, I, I, I was going to ask you about the personal weight or whatever of writing a book like this and you've just put it into that context. Um, is there anything, else, any th more, anything more on that you'd like to say? It would also be great if you could read a poem from the book, yeah. Um, I just, uh, for me, it was just a story and a moment in time that I just could not let go of. I, it, I, you know, I became quite obsessed with it and I just felt like there needed to be a way to redress the balance in which it had been told. Um, j as I sort of mentioned in the book, Jo Kim Yong had become a footnote to Lionel Terry's story and that really annoyed me. So I wanted to reclaim his, his life and his story um, and give him, you know, his moment, um, no matter how tragic, you know, it, it ended up being. And that was sort of like the thrust of, of why I wanted to write the book. And um, yeah, that's kind of what, what ended up happening. Um, but yeah, I can read from the book. Um, so in the book, there are three poems in which um, I guess they're kind of like monologues uh, one is from the perspective of Jo Kim Yong, and the other is from Lionel Terry. And I knew that I wanted a third one, which was, I guess, um, like a witness to the event. Um, and I ended up deciding that that witness would be Light itself. So this is a poem called In Which the Author Interviews Light. I am not petulant. Like you, I am merely hopeful. Where shadows bleed must lie a source of light. Light is warm and sure of its place in every widescreen vista or on a stage where it unfolds every scene. Light is proof that something is happening right before you. I am the I. I am the thought of least resistance. After belief, I make myself visible, a golden loose thread. I can be trusted. Just watch. This will move them. Here's where the body fell. No, wait, over there. There are so many ways to begin, I often confuse myself. Old age has worn my edges down. Nothing catches, nothing drags me through a life of usefulness. Sometimes I can't decide where the story truly starts or where to place their marks. Each event that punctuates the arc carries its own intention, as does each storyteller's tongue laced with favor and prejudice. Mine is to seek out the tension and violence in their vibrating hearts. Let me start over. 1905, this is the end. We meet again, same street, 
same sky. At first blush, the man falls down and stays down, language and music fleeing his body, freed from the limits of flesh and bone. From here, the world extends into white and the voices of the living carry nothing but death. If I could speak, all you'd ever hear is echo, over here, no, over here, there, passing through each version like a tragic round. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, on the, um, I in terms of Hiso Mask, um, on the back is a quote from a poem, and it is, this is my, I'll read it out, this is my blood oath with myself. And so you are, t I I'm from the old, I'm from, but I guess I'm a bit old school about actually saying, you know, so the the author's voice <laughs> in this here, you know, but I, I like the way that um, the uh, that uh, the I in these poems I miss uh, sometimes seems to be you, yeah. This is my blood oath, which uh, with myself, the only dead Chinese person I will write about from now on is me, which seems to me maybe to go uh, back as well as forward into this. Um, uh, volume, and I was wondering if that we could use that as a um, as a way to start talking about Hiso Mask. Yeah, so Hiso Mask was definitely written in response to How to Be Dead in Your Snakes, which um, was about another person and persons, and even though there was some personal experience that sort of um, you know was infused into some of those poems, um, it wasn't a, a book about me. Um, well there's also, the, I guess, the public and critical response to How to Be Dead in New Snakes, which was mostly very positive. But I guess it kind of made me feel quite anxious about being held up as like, ah, a Chinese New Zealand poet speaking on behalf of all Chinese New Zealand people, uh, which, no way, like that's never what I intended to do and never what I want to do. Um, and it made me feel quite... Uh, nervous about being put into a very particular box, about being the Chinese New Zealand poet, um, when I wanted to write about all sorts of other things. So in a way, that, was sort of that line that you read out was a, was a really sort of like cheeky way to sort of push back against all of that. And also because the book is very much about me and um, coming out and coming to terms with um, my queerness, it felt like a, a, a way to address that and to sort of say, actually, this is who I am. Um, so the, a lot of the poems in the book are about um, destroying and recreating identity because that's in a way what I was kind of doing with coming out to um, friends and family. I was sort of recreating um, who they thought I was in a way, yeah. Thank you. Uh, in our correspondence, I, I, I mentioned to you that uh, reading it, that reading it, we okay? that reading it um, really, really um, began to stir memories for me of um, my, what I call disco days and nights in my late 20s and, 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 my, my and into my 30s, which were in the, um, in the 1970s and 80s, and there may be a couple of people in the room who are around, <laughs> who are around then as well. Um, and uh, it, it, to me it was very, very moving because uh, there is a there is a um, a lot of um, of uh, searching, uh, some angst about it maybe, um, of looking for connection and for loneliness. And I can, I I haven't really revisited it for a long time, and it, it came up there I in that, um, and I thought about in the book here. Do those kind of feelings and reactions, which come from the poems, and a lot, mu and much, much more, of course, is it in fact part of a of a definition of mask, or what it's like maybe t to be masked at a particular time? It contains those those um, those uh, those feelings as well as whatever it else that you know the uh, notion of mask might mean. 
and I'm, I'm assuming we can extrapolate this out to other forms of identifications, but, you know, um, yes, uh, is it part of a definition of mask to feel those feelings, etc.? Interestingly, I did, a, I did a reading in Carterton last weekend and someone came up to me afterwards and said to me that he found that my poems were very masculine, which it, the first time anyone's ever said that to me um, because I don't feel like they are. But he said something about how the angst and the rage in them is a very masculine angst and rage. Um, you know, for this book, I'm obviously playing around with the, with the whole idea of, you know, maskness in, in, in queer um, communities and never feeling like I ever ticked those boxes or, or fit into that mold. Um, particularly as someone who was like really into poetry and Tori Amos and Bjork and PJ Harvey, like as far away from mask as you can get. Um, but then I think, actually no, those three women are pretty fucking mask. <laughs> um, so maybe I, I am in a way sort of channeling something from them in terms of how they articulate rage and, and anger in their own artwork. Um, uh, uh, so for me, a lot of the poems in those book in this book is is figuring out like okay well what does mask mean and is it something that I want to be pursuing is you know is it something that is is ever going to be attached to me as a person as a as a gay man and I think I think the answer is maybe I don't know depending on on who you talk to um, and I think you know a lot of the conversations that I've had since the book came out have been around that how do we redefine what masculinity is, not just for gay men, but uh, for men in general. Um, and allowing emotion and vulnerability to be part of the equation. So I think about um, a poem in the book called Crying at the Disco. Cry so Crying at the Disco songs are like my favorite subgenre of pop music. Um, songs about going out dancing while sad but the music th itself is really upbeat and, and wonderful. So I'm thinking like Robin. Um, so that, in the back of my mind while writing this book, was, was kind of how I was sort of thinking about masculinity. Um, and for me, that's, that's an ongoing conversation. Like, I'm, st I'm still having these conversations, and, you know, the fact that someone came up to me last weekend and said that he, he thought that the poems were masculine sort of really, yeah, surprised me and, and made me then think, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe I am a bit mask. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we could hear the poem. I don't know how long it is, Chris, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we could hear the poem. Crying uh, at the crying, crying at the, the disco. disco. Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to spring it on you, I but uh, yeah, you, uh, yeah. Find it. Um, and in, in fact, uh, you know, in skipping a little bit ahead. Um, in Supermodel Minority, uh, the, the third part of that book is called Poetry to Make Boys Cry. And yes. so I kind of feel like that, that is me revisiting this particular poem and this particular feeling and then sort of um, saying to myself, it's okay to cry at the disco. It's okay to hide in a bathroom stall and have a little bit of a cry while Madonna's playing in the background. We all need to go there sometimes. Uh, crying at the disco. The girls I thought I loved still follow me around. They are, square they are scare quotes in subsequent drafts. The boys I watch dancing together are so bright the walls begin to crack. They are both sides of a record, a beauty and an anecdote. Every time I think about you in loud places such as this, I dance until my heart breaks. I can't see you when your eyes are closed. And I can't hear you over the rush of bodies exhausting themselves, breaking down and breaking up. I need you like a whisper needs a shout, like a sad song needs a gentle, cold ending. <sighs> Thank you. Just a second. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, let's, you, you just mentioned crying in the disco connection through to um, super um, model minority and the, um, yes, and the um, uh, 
poetry to make boys cry. So let's, can we think about this astounding book? Okay. Um, I'm th just, I'm just channeling here um, a, 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 a journal chat from the Vic Books, which I understand is no longer with us. Uh, almost, I think, until the end of March. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and this was a question and answer, and it asks, how is Supermodel Minority different from your previous two collections? And it goes on and says things such as this, which I'd like you to maybe to comment on. And I think maybe you already have started commenting on these things, so it might just bring a few things together. I'll just read it if you don't mind. I even though it covers similar ground to my first, um, to the first two books, to me the speakers in Supermodel Minority feel more brazen and outspoken. They're sick of being ignored and are no longer embarrassed for being invited to the party. It's a collection where I, you, um, really challenge myself uh, both in craft and content and look for ways to use, to, to use both to amplify each other craft and content and use ways for uh, and look for ways uh, to use both to amplify each other. I was particularly interested this time around not to tiptoe around the sources of my sadness and frustration but to confront them head on. I've, I've, uh, and um, this is the effect it's had on me. Okay. Just take a moment of silence, just to kind of think about that. Um, oh. I've gone as well, yeah. Hello. It's a conspiracy. <laughs> One run done. I think we carry on, do we? Somehow. We're not going to let this stop us, are we? No. Not, not when we're going to be talking about being brazen and outspoken. Is it working? You can hear us? Can you? Yeah. Okay, cool. We'll keep going. Um, so, um, oh, you, if you use the mic, because it's for the live stream. So oh, for the live stream, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if we if we could read a poem that might um, reflect this. I don't know if now is the best time to do it, but um, yeah, reflect this. The attitudes you've got here, um, the the rallying calls, the you know yep. the oomph that you've got here. Yeah. Uh, so this is called version control. It has come to my attention that we have fucked things up. Not that we inherited the best bones to work with, some broken a few too many times, others carelessly tossed into suitcases that no one will ever claim. The bones don't always form a whole. It's 1616 and they're publicly burning us to ashes for sodomy. It's 1885 and they've made us criminals to protect decency. It's 1998 and they're beating us, torturing us and tying us to fences. It's 2021 and they're rediscovering old ways to erase us. Each time we say it gets better or that we will learn from the past, we set ourselves up for crushing failure. Jinxed and cursed, a self-addressed envelope for a future that will never come to pass. This time is no different from all the last times. In one version, we were golden. Our nights sweetly perfumed by the sea breezes of childhood holidays and apple crumble just out of the oven. We fail to mention that one year, a young boy's body washed ashore in non-accidental circumstances, and later, bad wiring in the oven was the cause of our house burning down. In another version, our days are drowned in blue screen light, electrifying our brains and keeping us up at night so that we stew in the unmistakable stench of bodies rotting under the floorboards. We buried our dead, but we didn't bury the causes of their deaths. And therein lies the seed of our predicament. All these versions of the past are the same explosion replayed at different speeds, and our failure to act is the debris blacking out the sun. 
We can't bury the lines between then now and now then, hoping no one will notice they're missing and go looking for them to prove we haven't changed at all. We can't be that fucking naive. Tell me which version of the world you want to live in. The one in which the definition of a body is a loaded gun waiting to be shot, or the one in which the definition of hope is a meteorite passing over our heads and disappearing into the uncharted skies. Both are valid, but only one will let you sleep at night. Thank you. Thank you. In the, you mentioned the final section of your, your book, and I'd love to talk about it all. The, the, I can't, Vexology one, <laughs> yeah. Um, I just think it's also, it's also astounding. The final section, Poetry to Make Boys Cry, just, just very, just touching on it. At first glance, the title, Poetry to Make Boys Cry, at first glance I thought it might be some, a little bit beguiling, a little bit romantic, you know. Um, um, but then I kind of reading them, and just as in, uh, uh, the, the, the poems that make boys cry and wider, I think um, th th their themes are, are quite wide ranging, aren't they? F such as, for example, they, they, they consider um, the end of the world, they consider the climate change. Um, Recently, dis recently denied by, a, and I won't go there, and um, et cetera. So is it that feeling that you mentioned, is it that idea that you mentioned way back at the beginning of our interview, um, some where you've come to some kind of uneasy, maybe, plateau or place with... with um, so things. even though, it, it, yeah, the... That title of that section is meant to be a, a little bit ambiguous because it doesn't really go into why the boys are crying. Um, they could be crying from joy and happiness, and that's kind of what I wanted to um, portray in a way. So there are poems in that final section which are about the end of the world and about things um, being hopeless and being in despair. But there's also a lot of, for me, hope and joy and love in those poems in that section. And um, I wanted to sort of yeah, surprise the readers with, with poems um, where they might cry from joy and, and happiness. And there's, there, there is, and there's also crying because you're laughing so much with one particular poem. Okay, well, and, um, and the, books are, the book is available over there for you to, um, you know, get the books and uh, read that poem, find that poem and cry with, uh, cry with joy and laughter, okay? I recommend reading it with your mum. Yeah, read it with your mother. That's <laughs> all we're saying, okay. Um, Great. Um, can we talk about your poet lorry laureateship? Six or so months now. Um, you, I've heard you describe it as life changing. Um, you may want to talk about that going uh, a bit further. Uh, I was wondering how how does it fit into your life um, and your lives, your writing, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, so after finishing and then publishing Supermodel Minority, I didn't think I would write a book for a very long time because I kind of felt like I had, yeah, excavated a lot of myself. I was actually really happy to not write for a long time and just sort of enjoy the book being out there in the world. Uh, and then the laureateship came around and suddenly um, I'm expected to not only, you know, write a lot of new poems but also to have opinions and thoughts about poetry. Um, go figure. And it's just been a real roller coaster. So from day one, it's just been your woe to go. Like I, I have been inundated with um, invitations and requests and emails, um, which is quite overwhelming, but also really exciting because it just actually shows that people are kind of excited about the role and excited about the potential of the role as well. So one of the things that I think I've been thinking about a lot since getting the role is, is this idea of legacy. And so, you know, the first time that I saw my name listed after David Eagleton with all of those amazing poets before him, I kind of freaked out a bit because I, I didn't think that I was good enough or ready to be included amongst their company. And I've sort of had to grapple with that a lot. Like I still haven't 
come to terms. You know, I, I said before that it, I still find it really hard to introduce myself as the poet laureate because I kind of feel a little bit of like, oh, you know, no one's going to believe me. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm trying to embrace that and to to embody the the significance and the and the mana of the role um, to the best of my abilities. But I also think that a role like the poet laureate is is a role about the future and a role about looking to the future and looking to opportunity and seizing opportunities, not just for myself, um, but for all poets and for all poetry in Aotearoa. So one of you know the big things for me is, is how do I use this role to shift the conversation about poetry in New Zealand and you know how people access it and how people get to enjoy it. Um, really sort of thinking about the role of poetry in our everyday um, that's that to me is the exciting stuff and, and to be able to work with poets and to bring them along with me is is a really important part of of what I think the role is should do because the role is initiated by public nominations so there was I, I was very aware of um, a campaign to get me nominated to be poet laureate and I you know I didn't want to get involved in all of that because I didn't want to be seen as sort of like being the puppet master. Um, but you know, knowing that, that there was this widespread support and um, so for me to be nominated just makes me feel like I have the backing of um, a lot of people already and that, that, that makes me feel so much better about stepping into it and, and being the Poet Laureate. Um, yeah. I was thinking of making you stand up and saying, I am the Poet Laureate, but <laughs> I, I don't think you need to. Um, Chris, you know, uh, the excitement about you being the Poet Laureate is still washing around everywhere and always will be. And I really, really, I so appreciate you being here and um, with your candor and your openness, okay, and for sharing your poetry with us. Uh, um, I think I would just like to finish on that note because um, you are our Poet Laureate and you are the nation's Poet Laureate. Okay. And it's also great to have you back at, um, but an, a, a here in Same Same with, your, with, your f with our wider family. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now, mihi, Chris.